Let's open up our hymnals now as we sing hymn number 634, Sweet Hour of Prayer. <laughs> chapter 4, and we're looking particularly at verse 9. We'll read the first nine verses there, Deuteronomy chapter 4, and uh, it's page 162. Hear God's word as we look at it together. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to, to observe that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I have commanded you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Surely I have taught you your statutes and judgments, just as the Lord God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that God has, or God's so near to it, as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are all or in all this law which I set before you this day? Verse 9. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself. Lest you forget the things your eyes have seen. And lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. 
grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. Well, Joe and Amanda, as little Oliver gets baptized today, it's a good time for all of us to think about the place that God has for our family and what he desires for us to do. Because in all the callings of our life, nothing is more important or, frankly, as much of a blessing or as much of a challenge as being a parent and a grandparent. And with this, also, nothing is more important than purposefully pointing to and training our children and grandchildren to trust and obey the Lord. This is why Proverbs 22 tells us, train up a child in the way they... uh, (coughs) Train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from them. This doesn't happen in a moment. This doesn't happen on a Sunday. It takes a lifetime. And it has eternal life as its goal, because we know that this life will not continue forever. And what will help us in this is, is not getting too focused or, or hung up either on the victories of the day or, or even its failures. But, but to day in and day out, persevere in teaching and pointing our children to the Lord and His redeeming grace, all the while praying that He might sanctify us and our families and make all of us more Christ-like and eventually bring us to heaven. And we have to have that bigger view of what God is doing with us in this life than, than sometimes we're tempted to have. It's kind of like the old story of Sir Christopher Wren. He was rebuilding St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And, and the legend goes that as he was surveying the work, he walked up to one of the builders and, and asked the man, what are you doing? The man says, I'm cutting stone. What does it look like I'm doing? He went up to another man, and that other man said, well, I'm earning five shillings a day. I'm making a living. He went up finally to the third man, and the third man replied, I am helping to build a cathedral for the glory of God. We're raising our children for the glory of God and the hope of eternal life. We're not just trying to get our our children through the day Or have some fun in this passing world. But we're to be raising these children for the Lord Jesus. To love him and to be his disciple. That they may be part of his glorious kingdom for eternal life. And to this end, God has given us, in these words that were given to the congregation of Israel, God gives us, as his congregation now, two commands for the Christian family life. In parenting as well as being a grandparent. And that is that we must guard our own hearts and live a life of faith in God while instructing our children to do the very same thing. Think about it. The context of this passage is that after 40 years of wandering in the desert because of disobedience, now the children of Israel are about to enter the promised land. And God had Moses give the congregation of Israel a command which applies to us today as well. Of only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And this first part of that verse, God is teaching us that we must diligently guard our own hearts and live a life of faith in God. God is making it clear to us that nurturing our children's faith in God begins in the home with parents, And grandparents who live or strive to live lives of faith, guarding our own hearts and striving to be consistent in obedience to God while also being quick to repent. As some will say, in other words, to be a disciple of Christ or to make disciples of Christ of our children, we're to be disciples of Christ. We are to to, to be honest before our children about about the glories of God and and about his faithfulness as even even our own shortcomings. Because we live trusting the shed blood and righteousness of Christ. We don't live any other way. And it'll take time for us to teach this. It'll take time for us to guard our own hearts in our daily life. Time studying God's word, making sure that God has no rival for our affections but receives our undivided worship, love, and faith. 
You know, a lot of times people will sit there and say, you know, at the end of your day, nobody will be sitting there saying, I wish I spent more time in the office. But when we stand before the Lord, no one will say, I wish, I, wish uh, uh, I, I could have done this or that more uh, in the sense of, of avoiding of God. It'll be, I wish I studied his word more. I wish I worshipped him more. See, God has not only given us, our children, to be a blessing to us, but he has also put us in our children's life to guide them in this from their infancy to their adulthood, to love the Lord and to know the Lord. And if we're going to teach our children about the great things of God, his covenant faithfulness, his great works to save us from the slavery, just as, just as Israel is to remind their children that, that God saved them from the slavery of Egypt, now God has saved us from the greater slavery of our own sins through his son. And if we're going to teach that to our children, it has to start with us. It has to overflow from our hearts as we live the Christian life, a life of faith in God. That's where it starts. I'll admit I probably won't quote this man very often, but J. Edgar Hoover rightly stated it this way. There is but one way to solve juvenile delinquency, and that is by providing each child with competent parents. How do we become competent? I think every parent, as we're holding that little one in our arms, even as they grow older, we don't feel very competent sometimes. But competency is not based on our own ideas, but on God's commands. That's what Paul writes about when he, when he speaks about the enduring nature of God's commandments. And then he adds in Ephesians 6, 4, he says, And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. And our children will see whether we are trusting the Lord or not. In fact, they'll see right through us. They know if, if the Christian life, God's kingdom, his worship is most important to us. And our life will either show uh, us growing closer to the Lord or walking further from the Lord. And honestly, that is a danger because our Christian life is not lived out in one day or lived in the past with our baptism or our confirmation. And this is why Moses warned the people, saying, remember the truth of God's word, his salvation, his commandments. In other words, if, if, you, if, we, if I'm putting it in our, our words today, it, it would be that we should pursue personal holiness, even in repentance. As Moses wrote, telling the people, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. We've got to remember each day, no matter what the news media tries to blare at us, and try to manipulate us to think, because it, it's making life very confusing now. Or it's trying to, or things, things that 40 years ago we, we had no doubts about, and now people question everything. We've got to guard our hearts from that, and the only way to do that is by looking at God's Word when God says this is the way it is. When He's made us male and female. When He tells us how to guard marriage. And he tells us how to obey him day in and day out by being honest. Not lying, not cheating, not stealing. <coughs> we need to be continually following Peter's instruction to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Particularly if we want to help our children in, in this life. Because frankly, children have wonderful hogwash detectors. <coughs> it's hard to fool our kids about what we truly believe, despite what we might say. Our children know what's important to us. <coughs> and they know this by how we live. 
and daily walk with the Lord. And in this, either we'll confirm a love for the Lord before our watching children, or we'll contradict it, and by our actions show God really is not that important to us. And rightly, our children, and even our grandchildren, will wonder, why should God be important to them if he's not to us? Catechism speaks about it in this general way. Our, by our godly walk, win also others to Christ. See, those first people that we should seek to, to win for Christ is our children. To desire for them to see Christ in us, and, and in turn desire that the God of their fathers, his blessing, his forgiving grace, his faithfulness would be their God. And this is why Moses then adds in verse 9, and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. And this brings us to the second and last point this morning. We must diligently teach God's word to, to our children so that, so that they would learn to guard their own hearts and, and live a life of faith in God. And we know salvation is from God. Holy Spirit's going to work when and, and how he pleases. And yet God has still given this, this covenantal responsibility because the normal way that God has intended to build his kingdom and, and bring his people to faith is by a godly family. So in God intends that the biblical faith be passed on from generation to generation. Over and over we see this command to teach our children, to instruct our children. This is why the word of God even addresses children. And so our goal as, as we, we teach and as we pray with and for our children is to direct them to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why God commanded that children be set apart for him in Genesis 17 by the covenant sign of circumcision. And contrary to what some say, uh, Jesus never contradicted this. He never said things have changed. Instead, what did he do? He took the little babies, it even says. In the Greek, that's what it includes. The little babies in his hands. And he blessed them and he said of them, Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Peter even calling people to remember God's command in Genesis 17. Preached to them in Acts 2.39. He says, For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Little Oliver is God's child. What we're going to do is just a symbol saying, God assuring us of that truth. And we're to raise them that way. To raise our children as God's children. And so what should we teach these children God has blessed us with? To guard their own hearts from sin and unbelief while trusting, to, uh, trusting and obeying God in the small things as well as the big things? Why do we do that? Well, it's because life is a spiritual battle. Which is why the scripture warns the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We're dealing with eternal issues. And so we must teach them the truth about a life lived before a holy God, our maker. Again, we're not accidents of chance, no matter what some scientists say. Other scientists actually coming around saying, even mathematically, the fact that God made us, the fact that we exist, is an undeniable reality. I know some will sit there and say, well, you know, I don't want to indoctrinate my child. I don't want to straitjacket them. I just want to let, let them choose for themselves. That's well, baloney. If you're not teaching your child for the Lord, then Satan is teaching him about his ways. It's like many of us probably itching or chomping the bit to, to maybe start a garden before too long, particularly as we can see the grass. And we haven't had that bad of a winter, thankfully. But do you plant your seeds and, and let it go totally thinking, well, I'm going to give my vegetables the liberty to grow as they will along the weeds. We know what's going to happen to that garden. Usually happens towards the end of the summer when I get tired of doing anything with the garden. The weeds take over. So easily. Now we can't live our child's life for them. Neither are you or I held responsible for the choices our children ultimately make. This is why God says in Ezekiel 18.20, he tells us, The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor shall the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. 
We're not responsible for the choices our children make. Yet God will hold us responsible for the godly instruction of our children. And yet even in this, God is the one who stands before us. God is the one who forgives us. God is the one who redeems us from our mistakes. And he is the ultimate instructor. I think if I had, a, uh, uh, had everybody in the congregation raise their hand this morning, or every parent, I should say, and ask if you've ever felt like you failed your kids, each parent would raise their hands. And again, we have a God whose mercy is new every morning. And when all is said and done, we can't live any other way than a life of faith, a trusting in God's grace uh, to, to undo and make up for our sins, our shortcomings. And when all is said and done, our goal ultimately for our child is, is that same thing. And it's to seek to bring their heart, the heart of our children and grandchildren, before the heart of our Savior. This is why we teach our children about the Christian life and salvation. It's why we teach them the catechism. It's just as a summary, basically, of the Bible, what the Scripture teaches. That's why we have family devotions. We do this desiring our children to have a godly honesty and integrity in this world. We pray for their Christian courage and so that they would grow in the fruits of the Spirit of, of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We pray for those things. We teach them in those things. In fact, to help them in this, what do we do? We make rules. And we back them up as God commands because he's told us uh, if we spare the rod, we'll spoil the child. We need to have the courage for our children to blame us. I can't go here. I can't do this because my mom and dad say I can't do it. They won't let me. You know, we need to be strong enough to be the parent and be the scapegoat for our children until God gives them the courage and the boldness to say on their own, you know what, I'm, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. Or even the courage to say, as Joseph did, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That's what we're teaching our children for. We want to teach them to stand for God, knowing as 1 John 2.17 says, the world is passing away and the lusts of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. I wish I could say that. It's going to be an easy task. It's not. But we have the Lord's word and we have his encouragement too that he's going to be with us. And brothers and sisters in Christ, we must guard our own hearts and lives and live the life of faith in Christ and teach our children the same, knowing God will forgive. God will make up for our failures. He's promised to redeem us, and he will redeem our children as well as they look to him in faith. And yeah, this is humbling. And admittedly, Joe and, Joe and Amanda, you're probably wondering even how this is all going to work out in your life with little Oliver, and hopefully maybe many more too. Remembering, though, it starts with praying to our Heavenly Father. He keeps His covenant. He, keeps, he, he is gracious. And God has given us His Spirit and His Word to direct us. And He's given us the church to come alongside of us, to help instruct each other and encourage each other and, uh, the Lord's grace, which we and our children need daily. And our encouragement is Jesus came and died on the cross, not only for us, but also for these little ones, too. For he said, let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such are the kingdom of heaven. So live a life of faith in Christ and teach your children this as well. Teach your grandchildren that we might both live and glorify the Lord and one day see each other in heaven by God's grace. It's a true story. The mother was dying of cancer and could not sleep because of the pain. Her unbelieving son, Douglas McMillan, hardened to the things of Christ, would come home and from work, and he would hear her singing even late into the night. And at times, too, he would come in, and he loved his mother, 
uh, despite the fact he was rejecting Jesus. But he'd come into her, and, and she would ask him to read various scripture passages. And one night, actually one week before her death, she had him read John 14. In the middle of the reading, she stopped him and asked, in a little while, I'm going to go and be with Jesus. I want to ask you one thing. Will you meet me there? And in many ways, that's what we're trying to teach our children. And of course, one week later, she died. Well, the Lord worked in Douglas McMillan's life. And he became a pastor in the Free Church of Scotland. He died in 1991 went to join his mother before God in glory. See, our goal as parents is not to make externally obedient children. Our goal is to be used by, by our triune God to help our children believe and trust and obey and love our Lord and Savior Jesus. And we're to keep doing that, even to our dying breath, leaving the outcome up to God, but praying that one day we will see them in the blessed eternal life to come by God's grace. Let's pray. Almighty God, and most gracious Heavenly Father, indeed, as you have said, you have told Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And you gave Old Testament Israel, the Old Testament congregation, the sign of circumcision. Now you've given us a bloodless sign because the blood of Christ has been shed for us now. And it's a sign of baptism. So we thank you that you have given us your son according to your promise, not only for us, but to, to be our savior, but to be the savior of our children as well. This is encouraging because we know we cannot do this ourselves. We know that... Uh, we don't have the power unless your Holy Spirit works in us. And so we pray, Lord, to you as the author and perfecter of our faith. Bring, bring spiritual growth into our families where it's needed. Bring healing into our families where it's needed. Bind us together in the love of Jesus Christ and help us to know you are present with us as parents. And when you're present with our children, these children that are here, and help us parent, as parents to know that in those struggles, in those days where it seems everything is going wrong, that you are there. And as we pray and look to you, give us all what we need for this life and for eternity. And help us to live a life of faith. And help us to teach our children to do the same. We give you thanks for speaking to us and promising yourself to us. And hearing our prayers even this morning, even for a little longer. Pray, strengthen Joe and Amanda, strengthen us as parents and grandparents, that we might live as you have commanded. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.